thank you for coming. Um, ah, Rashan, how are you? Good to see you. Great, thank you. Good, good, good. Mute yourself, please. All right, everybody, yes. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Oh, there's Kenny. How about that? Are you back? You're not back, are you? And Elizabeth, too. Yeah. No, we we are in suburban Minneapolis. Oh, Minneapolis. OK. Spending about one week excavating the multiple layers of cities of mom's life. Yes. And multiple wow. generations of things. Yeah. Uh, 130 or 40 years of accumulation wow. in yeah. one house, and we are going through it layer by layer, finding an archaeological it. dig. That's right. Yeah. 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 All stockpiled there. All right. Okay. Well, let's begin. A um, um, couple of comments first about where we are tonight. After the end of this evening, we'll be one third of the way through the book, but we'll only be one half of the way through these sessions. So you can see what's going to happen. We're going to probably have to have a lot more chapters uh, than we're going to be able to address easily. But uh, it's valuable to spend time early on in these in the dialogue, the first dialogue, which will end tonight, because once you've read one of these dialogues, you know pretty much what they're both going to say. Uh, but uh, what I will try to say to you next week is the, the way they say it and the emphasis they give is going to change, uh, certainly on the part of the friends, but particularly also on the part of Job. Um, and one, uh, let me say one thing about the, the whole structure of the book, which I haven't yet talked about. And this had a lot to do with my dissertation, actually, a very long time ago. Uh, when I first read the book of Job, and I read the literature around it, it's an enormous literature around it. My library in Dallas had perhaps 25,000 books <laughs> related to the book of Job in one way or another. I didn't read them all, I heard you say that, but um, I, I read enough to realize that many, many people imagined that the book of Job was essentially a, a series of monologues, that is, Job spoke, and then Eliphaz spoke, and Job spoke, and it was a kind of a dial, a, a philosophical series of monologues, and that struck me as very odd, and particularly when I read it with more care in the language, I realized how wrong that was. It is not, as a matter of fact, a mono series of monologues. These people are reacting to one another, and they are reacting rather directly sometimes, but the only way you can see that, and we're going to say a little bit more about that tonight, the only way you can really see that is because they pick up the words and languages that have been spoken before and use them in different ways. There's a phrase that you probably have all heard called hoisting one on one's pita. Well, that just literally means to take a phrase or a word from somebody else and use it against them. And this happens in political speech all the time, of course. And that is what happens in the book of Job over and over and over again. It's a very, very subtle dialogue. And uh, when I say things people like this to people, they say, well, but, but you know, these people, would they get that? Would they know that if they listen to this, if this really was a play, as I'm suggesting it might have been, would they have been able to pick up on that? And I think the answer is yes. It's yes, because this is an oral culture. It's a culture that only listens to things with their ears. Very few people could have read in this particular time in the life of the world. All they could do was hear. And that meant that because they could hear, they had to have their ears well tuned. Uh, perhaps the best uh, uh, example or analogy that I can raise is the Shakespearean one. In the uh, 17th, 16th and 17th centuries, Shakespeare, as we, if you, you, everybody's read some Shakespeare and you've seen some Shakespeare and you know how, how really subtle a lot of it is, how the language is so rich and so sometimes difficult to follow. You have to really pay very careful attention. And yet at the same time, the people that were in the theaters in the 16th and 17th centuries, they were not educated people. They were, they were not literate people. They were very few, probably could even read or write, or very few of them could. But they listened carefully because it was oral. The culture was oral. 
And that means that Shakespeare could be understood at several levels, of course. If you're reading Macbeth or seeing Macbeth, it's a good old bloody play. I mean, you can see that it's about um, this, that, and whatever, and a lot of people die, and it's the usual kind of stuff in Shakespeare. So you get at that level, kind of a grand guignol sort of thing, but there's also much more going on at the same time. I think the same thing is true in the book of Job. You can understand Job at a very simple level. Job is angry, frustrated, furious because his expectations have been dashed. He's been assaulted by something or some part of the universe is not functioning in the right way. And the friends say, oh, yes, it is. You're getting what you deserve. And basically, that's what happens. It just keeps going like that. And at that level, it's easy to hear in some respects uh, what, what's, at, what's at stake. But there's much more going on than that in the language itself. Words are being repeated. Phrases are being used. References are being made to other literatures in the Hebrew Bible. All of that's happening. And not everybody's going to get that. And that's fine. But when you begin to slow down and read with some considerable care some of these speeches, you will see how subtle it really is. Now, would they have caught all of that? Nah, probably not all of it. Uh, but this is true about any great literature, it seems to me. If you, if you read the plays of the Greeks, Aeschylus, Euripides, et cetera, Oedipus, and, uh, and all that, there are all kinds of things going on there, too. And those plays, of course, are much longer than the Book of Job that uh, people in ancient Greece would have sat in those theaters and they would have seen uh, the surface of the play, this person dies, that person lives, there's this sacrifice, etc. But in the language of the play, much is going on that is not doesn't first meet the eye. And no doubt they would have seen these plays several times, so they would have you know, become more and more acquainted the more times they saw it. Well, all that is to say that in the book of Job, there's a lot of linguistic games being played that you simply cannot see in English. It just doesn't translate very easily. So I, I raise that with you because I'm going to show you a couple of places tonight where that really is the case. All right, let's, let's start getting into the text now some. Uh, oh, by the way, the first question I want to ask tonight for our breakout room, yes, we're going to do breakout rooms again. Sorry for those of you who hate that. Uh, we are going to do breakout rooms again, and the first question is the same one I had last week, and that is, you are once again a costume designer, and you're going to be asked to costume both Bildad and Zophar. And of course, your costume will depend on how you hear what they say mm -hmm. and why they say what they say. So it obviously will depend on that, how you hear them. The central question for me about the three friends, not so much Elihu, but we'll get to him in a couple of weeks. But for the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, is where do they think their information comes from? I think they all think the same way. They all think that Job has done something really terrible, and that's why he's on the ash heap. But the question for them is, where do they learn this? Where do they get this? And my argument is, they get it in three different ways. And we'll say more as we get into the speeches themselves. And I think I'm going to ask you that question. Costume them based on what you think their information source is. Where do they get the stuff they're talking about? Where does it come from? That to me is a very important. Okay, let's look at uh, Bildad first. Now, if, if, as I said last week, Eliphaz can be heard in two different ways, at least two different ways, he can be heard either as overtly cruel, that is, he's saying things specifically to attack Job. I have often heard it that way myself. I'm, I'm beginning to think now that may be a bit too uh, simple. The other way to hear him is he just doesn't know what he's saying. He says things that sound deeply religious to him, but in Job's ears, they sound monstrous. It sounds terrible. So you might at least say, as some commentators like to say, that Eliphaz thinks he's being helpful, uh, tries to be helpful, tries to be supportive even, but in reality, he's not. Job can't hear it. He simply cannot hear it because his experience in his life is so dreadful and so horrifying 
that any claim that Eliphaz makes of various kinds simply can't be heard in that way. So that's one way to hear that. Now, Bildad, to the contrary, I think, is absolutely blunt and frankly so convinced he is right, he is willing to let Job have it with every barrel he's got. And he does. If you, if you see this, beginning in chapter 8, how long will you say these things and the words of your mouth be a great wind? All automatically, it's sarcastic, of course. A great wind, meaning that Job's language is just blowing. It's not, there's no content in it as far as Bildad's concerned. Does God pervert justice? It's ludicrous. That's a rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is no, it's absurd. God doesn't pervert justice. Does the almighty Shaddai pervert what is right? What are you talking about? Now it gets this, listen to this. This is horrifying. If your children sinned against him, God delivered them into the power of their transgression. Your children were murdered, killed because they richly deserved it. Oh my gosh. Isn't that appalling? Now, one of the questions I would ask, too, tonight is, let's assume that we're the audience, and we have watched the play up to now. We've seen the first seven chapters of the play. We know that in the prologue to the play, we know that Job is being attacked for reasons that are not altogether clear, and that his sin, sinfulness, supposedly, is a lie. He's not sinful. He's been described in two places as the most righteous, pious man in the East. So the fact that he's getting it here is raising for him some really terrible questions. So now Bildad is so convinced that Job is evil that he's willing to say such appalling things like that in verse 4 which is among the very worst things that any of these uh, authors, any of these friends really ever say. Now, right away, notice how it shifts, though, very quickly in verse 5. Oh, if you will seek God and make supplication to Shaddai. Oh, if you're pure and upright. Now, here's the first example I want to point out to you. I mentioned, I think, this last week in, in Eliphaz's speech. There's one of the words that was used twice in the prologue upright. The narrator in chapter 1, verse 1, calls Job quite directly the uh, upright. That's the word, uh, yashar. It means to be straight, to be absolutely right, to be righteous, effectively. If you are pure and upright, surely then God will rouse himself for you. So the implication is obvious. It's clear that Job is not upright, according to Bildad, because if he were upright, he'd be fine. God would be on his side. And of course, that's Job's problem. He does not experience so far God in this way. He just does not. And so Bildad is convinced because that's, that's the way he understands. Now, as the, as the play unfolds, as the drama unfolds, we're going to see the friends become increasingly irascible, increasingly angry at Job, because it's crucial for them to be certain that Job is convinced he is wrong. They're desperate to convince Job that he has done something worthy of this terrible experience he has had. Why? Because it's their belief. If Job is possibly both innocent and getting it in the neck, their understanding of the moral order of the universe collapses, and they can't have that. Now, again, think about this for a minute in terms of modern, modern day theological folk. Certainly, there are plenty of evangelical, very conservative Christians who believe exactly as Bildad believes, who, who say, in effect, if you do the right sorts of things, you're going to be rich and famous and successful if you do bad things you and if you're not rich and famous and successful you obviously are not acting in the right kind of way if you believe as i do if you accept these particular kinds of beliefs if you believe the end of time is coming whatever whatever they say they really are the build of the modern world that's for sure and so if there are in the world people like job 
who are essentially innocent people who have not done anything worthy of the kind of horrible life they are living, then how can we understand the moral universe? This is what the book of Job is really about. It keeps forcing us to think over and over and over again about what's happened uh, to the, the universe in the way that we thought was easy to understand, but it's not easy to understand at all. Though your beginning was small, he says, your latter days will be very great. Now in verse eight, I would suggest he's now gonna tell us where he found all this out. And here it comes. Inquire now of bygone generations, he says. Consider what the ancestors have found. We are but of a yesterday, we know nothing. I mean, we're just a blip in the whole structure of the universe. We've got to get ourselves rooted in bygone generations. Now, reflect on that a minute. And, and when you get in your groups, think about what that might mean. How do I understand? How do I hear that? Reflect on bygone generations. Uh, will they not teach you in verse 10 and tell you and utter words out of their understanding? And now he quotes a few proverbs here, which he no doubt has learned. Can papyrus grow where there is no marsh? Well, of course not. Papyrus is a water plant. You got to have water. It's absurd. So he's, he's making a, a point here by using these proverbial phrases. Can reeds flourish where there are no water? Oh, yet in flower they're not cut down. They wither before any other plant. Such are the paths of those who forget God. If you don't pay attention to God, you're going to be like a dry papyrus plant. I mean, you're going you're gonna to wilt. You're going to die. You're, you, you won't grow. That's the nature of it. They're con Unfortunately, this is the first place in the book where things get a little awkward in the Hebrew text. And so these next few lines, 14, 15, 16, are really hard in Hebrew. And I often say, you know, if you have a new Revised Standard Version, They'll have a few footnotes to sort of help you kind of un un unload some of this stuff. I always say that if they really wanted to be honest, they would multiply those footnotes by about 10 times. It's very difficult to read these verses, very difficult. So it might be a spider's house. It might be, uh, I don't know exactly what it means. It's, it's difficult to say. So I'm not gonna make a lot of deal about that. But in verse 17, I think we get clearer. Their roots, he's talking agriculturally, of course, plants, their roots, a twine around a heap of stone, they live among the rocks, and if they are destroyed from their place, then it will deny them. I never saw you. This is what happens to people who forget God, he says. See, these are the ways. Out of the earth, others will spring. Maybe that verse is very hard, too. God will not reject, he says in verse 20, a blameless person. But see, there's that word again. There's another word from the prologue, blameless. That's the word that was used to describe Job. He's blameless, blameless and upright. And Bildad has used both of those words. Blameless. God never rejects blameless people. Well, according to Job, that's exactly what's happened. You're looking at one right here on the ash heap, Bildad. Nor take the hand of evildoers. Oh, no. God will yet fill your mouth with laughter, your lips with shouts of joy. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked shall be no more. All of this is to say... Bildad says to Job, clearly, straightforwardly, your children died because they deserved it. Uh, God never takes the hand of a, of a blameless or an upright person. If you just turn yourself to God, you'll be fine. I mean, you'll, you'll have a, a long, good, happy life. Now, again, this, again, sounds familiar to me of a lot of modern, um, uh, particular Christian folks, preachers who like to say, turn it over to God. Turn your life over to God. You have to trust God, they say. Well, maybe, but sometimes people's lives are not quite so simple as that. And certainly Job, the author of Job, raises this sharply, this question for us. If Job is innocent and being assaulted, however, then what does that mean? Okay, chapter nine. I, I said last week that chapter nine is a very important chapter, and it is. Don't have time to look at it with tremendous care, unfortunately, but I counted one time, my dissertation long ago really spent a lot of time with chapter nine. I found, I think, over 30, 30, 3 references to other parts of the book in this speech. The author, I think here is trying to say 
that Job has listened as carefully as he could to what these friends are saying, and he now is reacting in a lot of very angry phrases, and it drives him crazy, literally mad to be told these things, which he simply can no longer believe. That, that's sort of where we are. Uh, back to my question that I raised at the very beginning of all this, how would you talk to Job? We all have Jobs in our life in one way or another. How, how would you speak? How do you talk to Job? That's a very good question to ask. Okay, verse, chapter nine. Now, Job starts to get sarcastic here. Oh, indeed, I know that's all so. But how can a mortal be just before God? That, I, how, how is it possible for a human being to, have a, a, to be considered vindicated or just before God? Now, remember what Eliphaz said in his little... Uh, wonderful speech that he got from God. How can a mortal be righteous before God? And the answer was no. And Job wants to know that. He went, wait a minute. If that's the case, if I cannot ever be found righteous, why should I bother? Why should I, why should I worry about God at all if I can't be righteous before God, if God is just some, some terrible creature in the sky? And it's what he's going to say at the end of this chapter, as you will see. I know if one wished to contend with God, one could not answer God once in a thousand. Not once. Now, the word contend is a very important word in this book. The Hebrew word is reeve. It looks like rib, R-I-B, pronounced reeve. And that word is always a word from the courtroom. This is a whole courtroom scene you're about to read here. Job hopes, imagines in his wildest, craziest imagination that he can get God into a courtroom and play prosecuting attorney with God and start getting clear about why God is attacking him. Because as far as he's concerned, it's God's problem. And he's going to make that very clear now in this chapter, as you will see. But if I know that if I, if I got God in the courtroom, I couldn't answer him once in a thousand times. God is wise and hard and mighty and strength. Who's ever resisted God and succeeded? It's absurd. He, now watch, you're going to get a, a typical poem of God's power here, but every part of the poem is negative. The power of God for Job is negative. Listen to it. It's a kind of an upside down look at the presence and power of God. God removes mountains and they don't know it. God overturns them in God's anger. God shakes the earth out of its place. Its pillars tremble, commands the sun. It doesn't rise, seals up the stars, stretches out the heavens and trample the waves of Yom, the sea, the sea, the God of the sea, trampling on that. May the bear and the Orion, the Pleiades, who does great things beyond understanding, marvelous things without number. I, I, I've heard that all my life. I know about these things, says Job. Who doesn't know this? But look, verse 11, now here's a shot at Eliphaz. He passes by me and I don't see him. Eliphaz says, oh, the great vision came, you remember, and stood before him and he, wait, he waited for it there. And then it revealed itself and spoke to him. <laughs> and Job says, well, he's enough for you to say, dude, but I've never seen God. God may pass by me, but I don't see anything about God. What are you talking about? God moves on. I don't perceive God. He snatches away. You can stop him. Who will say to him, what are you doing? God will never turn back his anger. The helpers of Rahab bowed beneath him. The helpers of Rahab is a reference to Canaanite mythology. Rahab is another euphemism for either Leviathan, the god of the sea. In Canaanite mythology, the great god Baal destroyed, defeated the god of the sea in order to create the universe. Uh, it's lurking below the surface of Genesis chapter one is a similar kind of mythology, I think. But in the Canaanite text, that's who Rahab is. How then can I answer him and choose my words with him? Even though I'm innocent, I cannot answer him. Now, verse 15b is badly translated in the New Revised Standard Version. It doesn't mean I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. No, I must appeal to God for my right, is what it says, for my vindication. Job, he's going to demand God to clarify what's going on in the universe. I don't get it. I don't, can't figure it out. Uh, if I, verse 16, if I summon God and he answered me, I don't think he listened to my voice. Uh, he crushes me with a tempest. 
There's irony here, but of course that word there, the word sa'ara in Hebrew is exactly the word that's used in chapter 40, uh, for chapter 38, when God shows up in a tempest, sa'ara, it's the same word. So in one sense, Job is right. God will come. And does God listen to Job? Well, we're going to have to get to that when we get to the final, uh, final thing in the Job later on in the, in, in the last, week, last day that we're here. If it's a contest of strength, God's the strong one. It's a matter of justice. Who can summon him? It's absurd. Though I'm innocent, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I'm blameless, God would prove me perverse. I am blameless. I don't even know who I am anymore. I loathe my life. Now get this. These are horrible phrases here. But Job feels he is driven to his extreme. Listen to what he says. These are astonishing phrases. It is all one. That's why I say... God destroys both blameless and wicked. And when disaster brings sudden death, God mocks at the calamity of the innocent. If it isn't God, then who is it? You tell me. Job has just described God as a beast, basically a monster of the universe, who indiscriminately destroys people right and left. I mean, Job is driven to this because of his conviction that his life is shambles. We mentioned last week, of course, as Nancy, I think it was said, well, wait a minute, he's had this great life up to now. What's he talking about? But he is so overwrought now. And, and there's no doubt that Job is a very unpleasant character. He, he is now driven to these bizarre claims. God now is for him not God at all, but some kind of monster, some kind of beast. My days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. They go by like skiffs of reed and like an eagle swooping on prey. My life is so short. There's no meaning to it. If I say, I'll oh, forget my complaint and put off my sad countenance, be of good cheer. <laughs> I become afraid of my suffering. I know you'll not hold me innocent. I'll be condemned. Why do I labor in vain? If I wash my hands with soap and cleanse my hands with lye, you plunge me into filth and my own clothes abhor me. God is not mortal like I am, that I could answer God, that, that we should come to trial together. Now, verse 33, important line. We have to remember this, and it's going to come up again. Verse 33, there is no umpire between us. Uh, that Hebrew word is mokiach. The translation umpire is quite a good one, I think. It, for those of us who like baseball, I'm a great baseball fan. Umpires, what do they do, supposedly? They are supposed to be completely impartial. They call them as they see them, and they're not on the side of anybody. Well, yeah, now we could argue about that if you wanted to, but umpires are called to be absolutely, unequivocally unrelated to either team. They just call them as they see them. So the word mohiak is exactly that word. It's a good, it's a good, a good translation, I think. There, but Job says... The, the Hebrew here is very interesting because in verse 33, it could be translated in one of two ways. It could be there is no umpire, or it could be would that there were an umpire. If there were just some person who could arbitrate between us, who might lay his hand on both of us, if he would take God's rod away. The problem with Job is God is God. God is powerful. God is overwhelmingly strong. And I, I, I can't talk to God. I can't and not let dread of him terrify me. I would speak without fear. I'd know that I, well, I, 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 could, I could do, I could talk to God. But there isn't any umpire. Would that there were, but there's not. Now, this desire that Job has for a third figure is going to not stop here. It's going to come up two more times in two very startling places. One in chapter 16 that we'll look at next week, and one in chapter 19, which we'll also see next week, which is among the most famous lines in the book, and we'll have to talk at some length about that. And now Job, after all that, goes back to his old self again, the one that wants to be dead, wishes he'd never been born. I loathe my life. I give free utterance to my complaint. I speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, don't condemn me. Let me know why I'm concerned. What's the matter with you anyway? What have I done? Can you reveal all the all the pronouns you here become singular now, and Job is talking only to God. He doesn't really care much about the friends at this point at all. Does it seem good to you to oppress, despise the work of your hands, favor the schemes of the wicked? Do you have, do you have eyes of flesh? Can you, can you see like humans see? No, you're God, you're God. I know all of that. I can't talk to you. 
are your days like the days of mortals? Verse five, your years like human years that you seek out my iniquity and search for my sin? Oh, you know I'm not guilty. What, what is it anyway with you watcher of human beings? Why, why are you doing this? What's it to you if I ever did anything wrong in my life? What, what's the point? You can see what Job is doing. He's approaching every single major belief that he's had and outright rejecting them. They don't mean anything to him anymore. They don't, the portrait of God that he gave, this God who rewards, it's just not true. Well, then what is it then? What, who is God anyway? Your hands, verse eight, fashioned and made me. Now you turn and destroy me. Remember, you fashioned me like clay. Will you turn me to dust? Like Genesis 2, of course. Didn't you pour me out like milk and curl me like cheese? Clothe me with skin and flesh? Knit me together with bones and sinews? You granted me life and love and your care preserved my spirit. Yet these things I think you hid in your heart. I know this was your purpose. You wanted to destroy me from the very beginning. You were just hiding behind all that lovey stuff which you give. <laughs> Pretty dark stuff, isn't it? Oh, yes. If I sin, you watch me. Never acquit me of my iniquity. If I'm wicked, woe to me. If I'm righteous, I can't lift my hip. Just make any difference if you're good or bad. It's irrelevant. I'm filled with disgrace. Look upon affliction. Bold as a lion, you hunt and repeat your exploits against me. Verse 18, why did you bring me forth from the womb? Would that I had died before any eye had seen me and were as though I had not been carried from womb to the grave. Are not the days of my life few? Let me alone that I can find just a little comfort before I go never to return to a land of gloom and deep darkness, the land of gloom and chaos where light is just like darkness. There are five words for darkness and gloom in those two sentences and about the full vocabulary of Hebrew <laughs> language, basically talking about gloom and darkness there. So Job has his second speech. He now accuses God directly of being bestial, essentially monstrous. And he knows that his life will end. He knows that God doesn't really care one way or the other. And he feels like he just keep jabbering like this, I suppose. He doesn't think about suicide, though. But he continually con argues about the pain and struggle he's in. All right, let's stop there and take a little break and, and go take our breakout room and ask yourself about Bildad. What does he look like? Why do you have him like that? And we'll take, what are you doing, five minutes, Diana? Yeah, okay, five minutes. Have a lovely time. Chat away. Well, if anybody would like to say anything that you've spoken uh, about in your group, I'm glad to hear it. Kenny? Sure. Yep. Sure. I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I was kind of conflicted between either seeing him as like the, the, the judge who has the answers and dispensed his answers, so then all dressed in a black robe. Or he's just very self-righteous, knows what's right, and, and whatever he says is absolutely right. And in that regard, all dressed in the white of perfection that he uh, <laughs> has the answers to all of the questions. Just listen to me. Yeah, good, good. Uh, you think Keith is dressed like that? Oh, Keith, what? <laughs> ah, yes, he is. I had uh, two extreme views, two extreme yeah. pictures. Either he was a uh, Nazi SS uh, guard, <laughs> or he was uh, the rabbi or from Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Two completely Sitting, different out of Fiddler on Sitting the by roof. the Eastern Wall. Prayer, yes, shawl. Yes. Prayer shawl hanging out in Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Good, good, good. Tradition. Tradition. <laughs> Reagan, you had something. Reg, anybody have? Oh, I was just saying we envisioned him in a power suit, like from the yeah. '80s. You know, like a wheeler yeah. dealer, privileged, yeah. wealthy. Yeah, type. <laughs> yeah three thousand dollars suit with nice, wonderful shine, three hundred dollars shoes. Yeah, right. Sure, that's good. That's good. I always, as I said to my little group, I, I, I always see him as a, a PhD guy uh, in a faculty with a robe on with the chevrons on the sleeve you know and all that with the mortarboard thing and all that business and he doesn't he since he has a phd he knows everything and so he's certainly willing to 
to speak regularly and often about every conceivable kind of subject. Uh, and um, I, when when my when our son and I wrote an opera on this book called Job's Truth, uh, Bildad was a very high and very kind of what we call an opera a tenore buffo, a funny tenor with a very high and kind of nasally voice. Uh, and because I think he talks fast, he moves fast, he's written a bunch of books and that, that's the way I see him anyway, but you know, that, that's just who I am because I, I round those, those people. I was one of those people for a long time, so I know. Okay, uh, let's go on from there. Let's look now at Zophar. Uh, Zophar, Zophar is not different, I think, than the other friends. He believes exactly the same thing. He believes Job is evil. He does, as a matter of fact, get off two really quite dreadful comments, <laughs> which I think are worthy of our reflection for a moment. Um, chapter 11, verse 2. Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and should one full of talk be vindicated? Should your babble put others to silence, and when you mock, shall no one shame you? Uh, you say, my conduct is pure, I am clean in God's sight. Oh, if only God would speak, oh yes, and open God's lips to you, that you would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for wisdom is many-sided. The word that's used there is a, in Hebrew, what we call a dual, it means several things at the same time. So it's, a, it's a not a bad translation to translate it that way. Wisdom is many-sided. Now here's this first great line. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt really deserves. <laughs> I mean, what's God going to do? Take away his pot shirt? <laughs> I mean, he does everything left, does he? So... <laughs> Bill uh, Zophar first says, well, you ought to be getting worse. I mean, you think it's bad, you ought to be worse because you're really a terrible person, terrible person. And there is one more great line that I don't want to miss before we have to stop tonight. And that is in verse 12 of chapter 11. After, after Zophar goes through a few things in verse seven, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find the limit of the Almighty? Can you, can you know the riches of wisdom and the, all that? You, you can't. You can't know any of that stuff. It's ridiculous. But I'll tell you what, Job, in verse 12, I, I love this line. It's a great one. You might want to use it sometimes if you want to really attack somebody. But a stupid person will get understanding on the same day that a wild ass is born human. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, not bad, I think. That's a pretty good line. <laughs> um, and the, of course the answer is never <laughs> it's never going to happen not only is Job evil he's also stupid and if he had any sense at all he would pay attention to what I am saying now the implication I would suggest about Zophar is um, I would say that Eliphaz gets his information from a vision that great vision he had in chapter 4 I would suggest that Bildad gets his information from the past he's read He's like preachers that say, read your Bible and you'll be fine. It's all there. Just read it. And so far, I would suggest when he says to Job, um, can you know the secrets of wisdom? No, surely you, you can't. You can't possibly. Can you find out the deep things of God? And I would suggest that, of course, so far thinks he has found out the deep things of God. And the deep things of God are that Job is evil and that he's getting what he deserves. In fact, less than what he deserves because he really is a monstrous human being. Well, there they are. Um, how Zophar is dressed, I'll leave that up to you. I think in a modern sense, I see him dressed very kind of casually like a like a evangelical preacher with uh, dockers and you know a, a nice button down shirt and some lovely uh, sneakers of one kind or another and he's prancing around the uh, front up there telling you everything that he knows and knowing that he is somehow closer to god than you are and certainly willing to say that to you regularly so i that's how i see him anyway okay you know what uh, I've, I've seen something in here i've never seen before and okay, that is in, in verse seven yep Actually, Zophar really does say what is true about God. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he thinks it's something else. Yeah, that's but right. His exactly. words are showing that he really understands God. Yeah, that's very good. I think that's possible. I think, you know, anybody who becomes in the theological world, if they become really absolutely flat convinced that they've got all the answers, it's very easy for people to keep mouthing these phrases which they've learned and known and uh, and memorized so that they can always pile them out when, whenever the occasion occurs. But some, sometimes, even against their own will, they say things that are pretty valuable. But much of the times, unfortunately, given Job's particular situation, none of these things are very valuable to him. Now, we have to go quickly now through chapters 12, 13, and 14. There are some really quite extraordinary things in each of these, and I want to just share some of it with you. In chapter 12, he's again very sarcastic at the beginning. No doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. <laughs> That's a pretty good line, I think, in some ways. But look, I have understanding like you do. I, I'm not inferior to you. Who doesn't know things like this? I mean, I've learned all, I've heard this all my life, all these things you're saying. The problem is it's not functioning. I'm a laughing stock to my friends. I, who called upon God and God answered me, a just and blameless man, and I'm a laughing stock. I don't get it. I, my life was so wonderful, so rich, so, so pious. I did everything right. I, and he'll tell you later on, he helped the poor and he was concerned about the marginalized and all that stuff. He's done everything the prophets told him to do. And it's gotten him nowhere. It's gotten him nothing as far as he can tell. But you know, the tents of the robbers are at peace, he says, and those who provoke God are secure. The world turns upside down. It's not that shouldn't be that way. God is supposed to, 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 to reward and punish. But it's not happening. It's just not happening, is it? Just ask for seven. Ask the animals. They'll teach you. They know. The birds of the air, they'll tell you. Ask the plants, they'll teach you. The fish of the sea. Who among them does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Now Job is caught theologically. He believes that God does everything, but if he believes that, then what God seems to be doing is terrible. It doesn't make any sense. If God is omnipotent, which that phrase simply seems to suggest that God is, then how can God, Job accept the fact that God is treating him like this? It's terrible. It, this is his dilemma, uh, put that nicely in a nutshell. In his hand is the life of every living thing. Doesn't the ear taste words and a, a, a palate taste food? Is wisdom only with the ages? <laughs> understanding of no. With God are wisdom and strength. God is counsel and understanding. Now, here we go again. Here we have a psalm of praise in verse 14 and following, but it's again negative. If God tears down, no one can rebuild. If God shuts someone in, no one can open up. It's all this power language, but it's negative power language. On and on and on. He leads counselors away, stripped in verse 17. He makes fools of judges. He loosens the sash of kings and a, a, a waist, ties a waistcloth on their loins. It, it's, it's this God is just out of control with God's power, says Job. He thinks anyway. He deprives of speech, etc. He pours contempt on princes, and on and on and on. He goes in this very angry way. He uncovers the deeps out of darkness and brings deep darkness to light. He makes nations great, and then he destroys them. He enlarges nations, leads them away, strips understanding from leaders, on and on. They grope in the dark like drunks. It's, it's a very, very negative poem about the power of God. Look, verse chapter 13. My eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. And I speak to the friends, of course. I would speak to Shaddai, to the Almighty. I desire to argue my case with God. I'm, I'm tired of you guys. As for you, now he gets very direct and very bold. You whitewash with lies. All of you are worthless physicians, using that language. If you would just shut up, that'd be your wisdom. Hear now my reasoning. Hey, listen to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak falsely for God and speak deceitfully for God? Will you show partiality toward God in your language? That's very interesting. We're still in the courtroom. 
Uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy both say in several occasions that partiality in the courtroom cannot be shown, even for the rich or the poor. You, had, you cannot show partiality when you're in the court. And Job is saying, you guys are showing partiality. And if that's not good, you'll, you'll be in trouble if you do that. I guarantee you, you'll be in trouble. He will rebuke you. Now, the irony is, of course, that's exactly what happens. At the end of the book, God does rebuke the friend. You have not spoken to me what is right, like my servant Job, God will say in chapter 42, verse 7. So in one sense, Job is correct here. Job is correct. Your maxims are proverbs of ashes, verse 12. Your defenses are defenses of clay. Let me have silence and I'll speak. Let come on me what may. I'll take my flesh in my teeth. Now, verse 15 is a very famous line. The King James Version translates this line very famously, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That became a very powerful phrase for an awful lot of people. And I, was, I remember the time vividly that I was doing the book of Job uh, with, uh, with a group of preachers, and I told them that's not what this says. The NRSV has this right. See, he will kill me. I have no hope. That's what it says. The reason the King James translated that way, they were probably horrified by what they were reading, but also they changed the text slightly, just enough with a, 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 a letter here and there to make it be very positive. It's not positive. It's very negative. God will kill me and I have no hope at all. That's, that's what he says. That's where he is now in his struggle in verse 15. This will be my salvation. The godless shall not come before him. I have I've maintained my connection to God. Oh, I know I've said some awful things, but, but I've not given up. I've not given up on God or on my own life. I have indeed prepared my case. I know I'll be vindicated. Who is there that will contend with me? I'll be silent and die. Only grant me two things. I'll not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand from me and don't let the dread scare me. Just God, take away your power so I can talk to you, so we can communicate with one another call, I will answer. Let me speak. You reply to me. How many are my trespasses and sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? Will you frighten a windblown leaf? Will you pursue dry chaff? You write bitter things against me. Make me reap the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in the stocks, watch all my paths, and on and on. It goes like this. And then he comes in chapter 14, in many ways, the darkest chapter for Job, in Job's speaking. And interesting enough, this chapter has been set to music by significant composers for a very long time. A mortal born of woman, few of days and full of trouble, comes up like a flower and withers, flees like a shadow and does not last. Brahms has what he calls four serious songs, and this is one of them from chapter 14 of the book of Job. Do you fix your eyes on such a one? Do you bring me into judgment with you? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one can. Since their days are determined, the number of their months is known to you, and you have appointed the bounds you cannot pass. Look away from them. Desist. They may enjoy like laborers their days. Uh, uh, Life is like hard slay slavery. At the end, you die. I mean, that's, that's where Job is now. You know, there's hope for a tree. If it's cut down, that it'll sprout again, that its shoots will not cease. And though its root grows old in the earth, its stump dies in the ground, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. But mortals die and are laid low. Humans expire. And where are they? As waters fail from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up, so mortals lie down and do not rise again until the heavens are no more. They will not awake or be roused out of their sleep. That is brilliant poetry, some of the greatest poetry in the Bible, but it's very dark, as you can see, very dark. Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol. Now he turns, I would say, with a kind of imaginative thrust. Hide me in Sheol so that... You could conceal me until your anger is past. <laughs> Job, Job is not asking for God to hide him in Sheol, the place of the dead, as some kind of reward. He is saying, you know, God, you are so angry at things. I don't get, I don't know why. Just hide me in Sheol until you calm down some. And then, you see, 
And then you would appoint me a time and remember me. Oh, where's my old buddy Job? If mortals die, will they live again? No. Like Psalm 88 says, the dead do not praise God. God does not come to the place of the dead. Now, Psalm 139 says quite the opposite. Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? It's obvious that the Jobin author has partaken of Psalm 88 much more than he's taken of Psalm 139. All the days of my service, I would wait until my release would come. You would call and I would answer you. You would long for the work of your hands. This is a wild speculation that Job has now about God hiding and then calling him forth when God cools down. For the, and then you would not number my steps. You would not keep watch over my sin. My transgression would be sealed up in a bag. You would cover over whatever iniquity I have. But no, the mountain falls and crumbles away and the rock is removed from its place and the water wears away the stones and the torrents wear, wash away the soil of the earth and you destroy the hope of mortals. You prevail forever against them and they pass away. You change their countenance and send them away. Their, their children come to honor and they don't know it. They are brought low and it goes unnoticed. They feel only the pain of their own bodies and mourn only for themselves. Well, it's a very sad, melancholy, dark, broody kind of way that we leave Job at the end of the first cycle of speeches. Now, there are, again, several things might happen. We don't know what's going to happen yet. We don't know, but you can jolly we bet the friends are going to have some say about this, and they will. Now, what we have to look for for next week is we're going to be doing the third cycle of speeches, uh, the second cycle, excuse me, uh, chapters 15 to 21. That's the second cycle, same pattern, Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, so far, Job. The same thing will happen. But I want you to pay careful attention, if you have a chance to read this, uh, how, diff how is it different? I don't think it's going to be different in content in terms of um, their beliefs in things, no but it's gonna be different in tone. The tone is going to sharpen, I think, become much more painful to listen to, I think it's what. And in two places, I want you to take particular care with two places. Job 16, 19 to 21, where Job talks about a witness. I want you to think about that a bit. And then perhaps the most famous line in the book, made famous certainly by Handel's Messiah, chapter 19, verse 25. It's in the middle of a section beginning in verse 23, concluding in verse 27. I know that my Redeemer liveth, says the King James Version. I know that my Vindicator is alive, read some. I know that my avenger is alive. There are all kinds of readings of this, and it re it's a wonderfully complex passage, but it has been used in some very interesting ways over the centuries, and so I want to spend some time with those, both 16, uh, 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 17 to 19, and um, 1923 to 27, which are Job's attempt, I think, to find another person, a figure apart from God, who can give him some hope about vindication. He comes to the conclusion eventually that God will not vindicate him. And so he's, got to, he's just anxious to find some way of being shown to be right. Now, the, the wonder of this book is, um, for us all, I think, is will there be an answer to any of this? Will Will the author of the book of Job provide for us some kind of answer to this? And the speeches of God are described as answers to Job. And so God answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, is chapter 38. What kind of an answer will that be? Well, we have to, ultimately, the meaning of the book of Job for you is going to come down to how you hear those speeches of God. And we'll get to those a couple of weeks, but uh, that's where we're driving. We're pushing in that direction. It's going to be pretty clear fairly soon now that we're not going to get anything out of the friends.
And we'll see how that plays itself out in the book that we have. But ultimately, we're going to have to find out what does God have to say about all this and why is it put in that particular way? It's, it's really exciting, strange, challenging, brilliant stuff. Okay, we have a few minutes. Uh, questions you'd like to raise? I have a question of uh, the scripture that you wanted us to look at. Chapter yes. 16, what verses? Uh, 16, it begins... Um, <laughs> Uh, verse 18 through 21. Okay. 18 to 21. Sorry. Yeah. And then uh, 19, uh, 23 to 27. Yeah. Okay. Shirley, question. Oh, I was just saying, I, I keep hearing um, Rudder's Ruckman with that steady beat. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sort of like the doom. <laughs> It's inevitable. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. I, you know, there have been a few musical compositions based on the book of Job. Uh, Vaughn Williams has one called Job, a mask for dancing, uh, which is quite interesting, actually. There is an oratorio written by somebody whose name I can't remember, actually, not, not a well known figure. Um, but it hasn't really played all that much of a role beyond, of course, Messiah, uh, Handel's Messiah. Uh, the author of the libretto of Handel's Messiah was a very traditional uh, evangelical Christian person uh, in the early part of the 18th century, and he provided a typical reading of the Old and New Testaments by always pointing toward Jesus. I mean, Messiah, after all, is about Jesus. And uh, the third section of Messiah begins with the soprano aria, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Clearly, for many, many commentators, uh, that verse has meant a prediction of some kind or other of the coming of Jesus. That, that's the way it's been heard by many, many people over the centuries. I don't hear it that way, but eh, we'll see. We'll see. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I was just wondering why um in if this is a play mm -hmm. why the the um actors in it why in the dialogue there's never any talk about the the devil who kind of yeah. teed this up with god like right. everything it's almost like in their minds god is everything yeah. and the devil doesn't exist yeah or it's not a character worth bringing in. That's right, exactly. I think the, the, the prologue, which has the Satan for us, as I suggested, uh, that figure simply drops out of the story altogether. And I, I, my own feeling about that is, is that we don't want to confuse the basic question here. And the basic question is not to search for another character to blame or to call into question. It's all about God. It's about God and Job and the friends. That's what the play is about. And how we're going to adjudicate that, how the play goers, how the listeners to the play are supposed to, to evaluate um, that particular question. Who is God in this story? That's why I call this what I did. Will the real God of the universe please stand up? And that I think is what the author is trying to do. Now, whether or not he'll be able to do that, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. But the, the Satan figure just drops out, just goes away, goes away. It, it, it's difficult to get rid of him in our own minds. I mean, you've certainly seen him in the prologue, but he does not come back. And when God shows up, there's no talk of the Satan. That's for sure. It's only Job and the universe. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, okay. Next week, we'll get into the second cycle and see if there's anything new to learn. All right. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll go away for this evening. God, thank you for this extraordinary book. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written, but it sure energizes and challenges us and surprises us and makes us think carefully about you and about our relationship to you and about our relationship with one another. We're grateful for the group here, the group that comes and reflects and thinks and struggles 
with these words. Be with us. We ask you to stay with us, stand with us, as we attempt to find out who you are and who we are in your sight. And in all things, we will praise and bless your holy name. Amen. Thank you all. See ya. Thank you, John. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.